This video was sponsored by HelloFresh. So getting back to our journey through time, the state of life at the end of the Devonian was very different depending on where you were standing. If you were one of the pioneers of the land, the world was pretty nice. Forests were spreading out from the rivers and marshes, and there was getting to be more and more opportunity here all the time. But if you lived exclusively in the ocean, well, you're probably lucky to be alive. The world's oceans had been hit by a mass extinction that only left around 4% of the animals that were thriving previously. But the land didn't seem to be having these issues. I say good riddance. Well, that's rude. Everything keeps trying to eat me. You think that's gonna stop just because we're on land? So basically, as we go into the Carboniferous, there was once again a power vacuum in both the marine and terrestrial environments all over the world, for two totally different reasons. In the ocean, life was bouncing back from the death of the armored fish and many other dominant groups. And on land, the spread of the massive global forest would open up new opportunities for those who were able to adapt. This forest would become so all-encompassing that not only would it have a very unique effect on our planet and its inhabitants at this time, but it would even affect our modern world in a critical way. Which is wild to think about considering this period began 358 million years ago. I've been looking forward to this one, so let's dive into the Carboniferous Jungles. During the Carboniferous, the world was undergoing more drastic changes than ever before. Gondwana was slowly drifting northwest on a collision course with Euramerica and Siberia, and the small chain of islands that started to form to the northeast of the supercontinent during the Devonian had grown into a small landmass in its own right. It's impossible to tell from looking at it, but this small island continent will one day make up part of China. The formation of this landmass further isolated the Panthalassic and Paleotethys oceans from one another. But the real massive change was when this little blue and brown marble finally started to change into a blue and green marble. Plants, fungi, cyanobacteria, and a few animals had been able to establish themselves on land in some capacity leading up to this time. But generally speaking, the first pioneers were restricted to staying close to the waterways. But this was all about to change, because in the hot, humid climate of the early Carboniferous, there was about to be an explosion of biodiversity every bit as impressive as the Cambrian or Ordovician explosions that we saw in the oceans of the past. And the first organisms that we see this with would be the plants. Horsetails, club mosses, ferns, primitive conifers, and cycads all get their start here. And that's just the ones that we're familiar with today. This jungle would spread out from the rivers and ocean and cover the entire globe in an endless tree line unlike anything we've seen up until now. And this would have a profound impact on the world in several ways. For one thing, the presence of all this plant life also meant a massive increase in oxygen. And any time that we see big changes in the air, usually that makes for big changes for everything else, as we've seen before. For one thing, it started to change the climate. We start to see a cooling trend by the middle Carboniferous that leads to an ice cap forming at the South Pole for the first time in millions of years. Probably the only part of the land that wasn't covered in vegetation. As this runaway effect continued on, generations of plants would come and go, and old vegetation would fall to the forest floor, either just through natural processes or, much more likely, forest fires that would be taking place as an extra consequence of all the oxygen in the atmosphere. And these plants spent their entire lives taking in CO2 and expelling O2, leaving the C, or carbon, locked in their tissues. And over the 60 million years of this period, this would be something that would be locked away in the Earth forever. So slightly off topic, this is something that I hear from people all the time. People who say the use of fossil fuels means that we're using the liquefied fossil remains of dinosaurs are pretty much dead wrong. The overwhelming majority of the fossil fuels in use today originally are dated back to the coal beds of this time. 100 million years before the first dinosaur ever existed. In fact, there's so much carbon in the deposits all over the world from this time that this is the inspiration behind the naming of this entire period. The Carboniferous. Checking back in with the oceans, 
as I said before, the state that it was kind of left in by the end of the Devonian was pretty sad. But of course, as always, extinctions leave opportunities open for the survivors to expand into new forms. And in the warm waters of the early Carboniferous, there was about to be another mass diversification. Echinoderms, cranoids, gastropods, and bivalves all managed to pull through. And the cephalopods were still hanging on as well, but by now the straight and curved shelled varieties had died out. What was left was the ammonites and the true nautiloids. Which, despite animals like the modern nautilus bearing a resemblance to ammonites, this is how far back the two groups actually separated. The trilobites were still around, but unfortunately, they were definitely on the decline compared to previous periods. They may have been starting to get outcompeted by other forms of arthropods like the true crustaceans. This seems to mark the end of the invertebrates' reign as the rulers of the oceans, as the fish, despite losing 96% of their biodiversity by the end of the Devonian, were about to take control for themselves, and this time it would be in a much more familiar form. This was the Chondrichthian's time to rule, the group of fish that, among other things, would lead to the shark. Now this line of fish has been around since all the way back in the Silurian, but they had remained smaller and relied on their cartilage-based skeletons to allow them to be faster and evade the armored monsters that were filling the dominant roles. But now, after the fall of the Eurypterids and Placoderms, it was the perfect moment for them to become the masters of the sea. The Chondrichthians radiated into several different groups. The most successful being a different group from the true sharks called the Eugeniodontids. These creatures had some very interesting face and headgear, but otherwise, a lot of them were starting to be very similar to modern sharks. For example, there's the early species called Cassiotis. This was one of the basial members of the group, and although they would survive for quite a long time, it would also give rise to several other noteworthy creatures, like the slightly more unique Ornithoprion, which in itself would be the direct ancestor to probably the most well-known member of this order in the future. The fish quickly bounced back as the Carboniferous went on some groups even managing to spread into freshwater ecosystems, putting them in close proximity of the new world opening up in the air above. And this world would be a world of swamp monsters and giant bugs. As oxygen levels skyrocketed and the land was covered in tropical forests and swamps, the vertebrates and arthropods were about to take their age-old evolutionary arms race to the new frontier. It was at this time that some of our tetrapod ancestors started to become true amphibians, finally developing the fins and fin-like legs into proper weight-bearing limbs. The earliest example of this was with a creature called Peterpees, a name which means Peter's foot. Who's Peter? This one meter long creature is very important because it's currently thought to be the evolutionary link between the tetrapods that were more similar to lobe fin fish and the true amphibians. And also because fossils of land animals from the early Carboniferous are extremely rare. So for all we know, there might have been a ton of other animals like this crawling around. But as time goes on, we do see a lot of other strange types of amphibian in the later stages. Some of them even have had their shiny new legs shrink and become more snake-like. Like this thing called Colorado Erpatin, and then someone in the opposite direction, and further develop their limbs for walking on land. Like Tutty Tanis. And we even have some major predators coming from this group, like Anthracosaurus, measuring up to three meters long, and is also known as the reptile-like amphibians. But the most dominant of all, was a group of ruling amphibians called the Temnospondyls. Large species like Eriops may have grown up to 3 meters long and 200 kilograms, probably hunting somewhat similar to, once again, crocodilians. These were some of the most powerful vertebrates on the land. But unfortunately, not only did our arthropod competitors have a head start colonizing the land, but the way that they were designed was going to give them an edge in this high oxygen environment. You see, unlike terrestrial vertebrates which have two lungs and breathe through their nose and throat, terrestrial arthropods have openings across their bodies that connect to the tissues that need oxygen. 
That's why today there's an upper limit to the maximum size that arthropods can reach. Because in today's atmospheric oxygen level of 21%, bugs can't grow to 3-4 meters long. But if you crank the oxygen up to say 35%, as it was in the Carboniferous, suddenly the limit has been raised. In these jungles, there were giant bugs. Like the terrifying 70 centimeter long Pulmona scorpius. Yes, this was a scorpion the length of a human arm. The largest any terrestrial arachnid would ever grow. And we also see the largest land invertebrate to ever exist, the herbivorous Arthropleura, a millipede that could grow up to two and a half meters long. And the bugs would even take to the skies for the first time during this period. Most well known of which being the falcon-sized Meganeura, a relative of modern dragonflies and damselflies. And among all these monsters in the tropical landscape of the Carboniferous, there was even a relic of a bygone time lurking in the swamps. The one and a half meter long Campiocephalus, the very last of the sea scorpions. Despite this guy's pedigree for predation, the Eurypterid's days were long past them at this point. Basically nothing more than an oversized horseshoe crab, probably using its shovel-shaped body to push through the muck and scavenging on whatever it could. A humble end to what was once the top predator of the oceans. With all these strange creatures around, the Carboniferous Swamps was likely a very dangerous place for many of the smaller vertebrates running around. Our direct tetrapod ancestors were constantly having to hide from giant carnivorous amphibians and bugs. Uh, you know, I have a better idea than you trying to eat me. Instead, you should consider taking advantage of the special offer by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you can experience a harvest at home with their newest seasonal recipes, like scallops over butternut squash risotto or balsamic rosemary pork chops. And, if there's anything about the meals that you don't like, you can easily customize them with Hello Custom by swapping out proteins or sides, upgrading your choice proteins, or even adding proteins to a veggie meal. So it's never been easier to eat your way. We recently had the crispy chicken and bacon alfredo with spinach, parmesan, and chives. It was absolutely fantastic and simple to make. And what's even better, HelloFresh isn't even just for dinners. You can shop the HelloFresh market for quick breakfasts, wholesome snacks, or even desserts. You'll find everything to satisfy your cravings without stepping foot in a grocery store or a mini mart or having to chase after a slippery tetrapod. Just go to HelloFresh.com and use the code PALEONALYSIS65 for 65% off plus free shipping. That's right, we're taking 65% off your first purchase if you use this promo code. And what's even better is HelloFresh's recipes include pre-portioned ingredients. That means less food prep for you and less wasted food. Sorry, Sea Scorpion, no food for you. So that's your plan, huh? Don't eat me, eat this instead? Yep. Alright, I'll allow it. Now run along, my little sponsorship monkey. Again, just go to HelloFresh.com and use the promo code PALEOANALYSIS65 for 65% off plus free shipping. Setting aside all your shenanigans, I think we're going to need a new strategy to survive this jungle. It's time for us to free ourselves from the swamp. Here we go again. Finally, a mammal adjacent. Going into the late Carboniferous, there was a major change on the horizon for our ancestors. You see, despite the fact that the forests were spreading far inland from the rivers and swamps, we were not able to do the same. This is because the early tetrapods were still dependent on the water. We could breathe air, but our skin was not capable of holding water. So if we spent too much time on dry land, we ran the risk of drying out. And our eggs were still completely dependent on the water. So for a while, we were kind of stuck. But these were all issues that we were going to overcome around 320 million years ago. As some of the amphibious tetrapods became the very first amniotes, their thicker skin would protect them from drying out. And now their eggs would have a hard membrane or shell that would make them less physically fragile as well as allow them to be laid outside of the water. We were now truly all-terrain organisms. 
and with these new adaptations, the Amniotes spread across the world, diversifying into two major clades, the Sauropsids and the Synapsids. Despite these early members of this order looking very similar to each other, inside there were differences that would be the first signs of things that would become defining features of the two clades. These can best be seen in the skulls and teeth. While the skulls of Sauropsids had two openings besides the eye socket, Synapsids only had one. The earliest known sauropsid was a tiny lizard-like animal called Cassinuria. This was the earliest animal to have claws on its fingers. Yet another adaptation that would be massively useful for future generations. And despite it looking very lizard-like, these guys actually are not true lizards. Actual lizards wouldn't evolve for several million years. And the earliest of the synapsids would be my new form. Archaeothris, who, again, looks like a tiny lizard, but was actually more advanced than the early sauropsids. It had stronger jaws than most animals at the time for this size, and actually had a pronounced canine tooth. That was another thing that started to separate the sauropsids from the synapsids, is that the synapsids tended to have different kinds of teeth in their mouth, at least much more pronounced differences than what we saw in the sauropsids. Now, despite all the amniotes looking pretty similar early on, they would explode over the next 20 million years, and once again be able to fight back against the giant bugs and the amphibians hiding in the swamp. And they would get larger too, with herbivores like Desmetodon and carnivores like Limnoskylus. Despite this period often being referred to as either the Age of Amphibians or the Age of Giant Bugs, depending on which side you're on, I guess. By the end of the period, the Amniotes were making a decent case for themselves as they managed to go anywhere that they wanted to. And it was a good thing that they did, too, because as Gondwana and Euramerica came together, there was going to be a lot of changes that will spell the end of the global rainforest. As more and more CO2 was absorbed by the global rainforest, this steadily continued to have an effect on the climate as well. Through most of the Carboniferous, things remained pretty warm and humid, just the way the amphibians like it. And the oxygen levels kept getting higher, just the way the giant bugs liked it. The problem was that this was creating a cycle that inevitably could not sustain itself, because CO2 is also a greenhouse gas needed to keep the warm temperatures up. So the more carbon got locked in coal deposits, it did start to get cooler. The glaciers over the South Pole started to expand. This dropped the sea level and made the climate drier. And then, as things were already starting to get dicey, Gondwana, Siberia, and Euroamerica would finally come together to form the massive supercontinent known as Pangaea. And this would be the tipping point. As the world continued to get cooler and drier, suddenly it became much more difficult for rain clouds to carry water from the ocean to the interior of the continent. And without rain, there can be no rainforests. This is known as the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse. And this would be the event that brings this period to an end. As the southern region became locked in ice, the swamps and rainforests started to disappear. This would spell the end for many of the dominant amphibians. And another consequence would be that the oxygen levels would no longer be able to hold at such a high percentage. So, although insects as a whole would be fine, this would also be the end of the giant bugs. A few temdospondyls would manage to hang on in the coastal areas near the equator. But, ironically, our ancestors were doing quite okay. And now, in this new dry world, the amniotes were going to take over. Especially the synapsids. Ah, Tim Tim, I see you followed me down the path of the stem mammal. Is the coast clear? Yep. Most of the bugs and the swamp monsters are all dead. Tim Tim here has evolved into another synapsid called Aerosaurus. And I can't help but notice that you've picked a form that's particularly good at running. That's right, and I now have very well adapted teeth for hunting, so now I'll be the predator. Things are starting to look up for us for sure. Despite all that we've seen up until now, somehow we've managed to not only survive, but come out on top. And with all that carbon safely locked away underground, the climate will remain nice and cool. After all, it's not like some inquisitive little monkey's gonna come along and start burning it as fuel and releasing all those greenhouse gases into the air. Cause that would be insane. 
And on that note, I would also like to once again thank HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video. Again, go to HelloFresh.com and use the code PALEOANALYSIS65 for 65% off your first order and free shipping. Alright, that's all I have for today. Have a good one, everybody.